first I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, you've all heard, probably half of you anyway, have all heard my story before. Um, but here it goes again. <laughs> Um, I'd also like to thank Karen and Mike and Jeff. Um, I've shown here since this place started, um, off and on, and uh, they're very supportive. This gallery is a wonderful place, um, and just to have these little talks going on all the time is particularly interesting. Um, okay. As you can see, I have quite a list here. And when I first was thinking about this, um, I've done some of these talks before. And I, I, I know that you want to hear about my influences and my uh, inspirations and my techniques. And then Karen would like me to talk about Dadaism. And I'm no art historian, believe me. Um, but, you know, oh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, a little a bit about my misbegotten youth. I don't want to bore you too long. I started out doing the speech over and over and over again for the last week with my dog sitting in a chair in my studio. And I bored the hell out of her. And after I got through around 45 minutes, I realized, hey, I haven't even gotten to high school yet. I mean, these people are going to go nuts. <laughs> but anyway, um, I'm an only child. And I'm only saying some of these things because I think they end up being a what caused me to be what I am, whatever that, that, that is. Um, but I'm an only child. My parents were both veterans in World War II. Um, so my father was in his late 30s when I came along. And um, my mother was in her middle 30s. Um, we, when I was two, until my father started having serious geriatric problems when he was around 78. We lived in the Mid-Cape region of Cape Cod, um, somewhere in the town of Barnstable for the most part. Hi. <laughs> um, anyway, around there when I was a little, little kid, my mother was very sort of outgoing. Um, and we met a guy named Ralph Cahoon. Does anybody know who Ralph Cahoon is? There you go, one guy. <laughs> Ralph Cahoon is a folk painter, although he really wasn't a folk artist. Um, he had gone to the Boston School of Practical Arts, which I think now, I'm not quite sure, um, is the uh, Mass College of Art. And when I was a little guy, my mom would, would take me by once in a while. She was friends with his wife, who was also a painter. This, he painted what was primitive paintings of his parents and grandparents' livelihood, which was basically whaling and captain ships and all that sort of stuff. And I remember one time vaguely going by there and my mother and Martha, his wife, went off. Um, and uh, he was sitting, I was sitting in the shop with him, and I was probably seven or eight. And he was sitting there whittling away on a whale. And it was on a little half inch piece of basswood or, or, or pine or something of that nature. And he had drawn a little whale and, uh, on it. And I had no idea what it was about, but he was carving away at it. Um, and we'll get back to it, but 15 years later, I finally discovered what that was whale about. Whale was about. Um, my first 14 years, um, wait a minute. Yeah, my first 14 years. I was talking to somebody in the fire department one time years ago, and he's, I was describing my schooling and stuff like that. And he said, well, were you an army brat? And I said, no. 
um, I said my father was account an accountant and we moved a lot. And essentially in my first 14 years of life, um, I moved nine times. That's once every year and a half. That's once every year and a half I went to maybe a different school. Sometimes I'd come back to that school later. Um, what that does to a kid is that it makes them pretty damn introverted and they learn to entertain themselves real well. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, no, I already did that. I just did that and I, already, I knew it already ahead. Anyway, in our travels, I lived around Boston, I lived around Hartford, I lived around um, Washington, D.C. for a couple of years, and we always had a house on the Cape. Um, my mother took me to every friggin' museum. She was a frustrated writer, and she took me to every museum as we traveled around. Um, I went to the Boston Museum when I was a little guy, the Fog, um, the Gardner, the Wadsworth Anthenaeum, and of course the Smithsonian, the National Gallery, and all that. And she would take me there. And when I was around, I guess around 11 or 12, I don't really remember, she took me to, um, we went to, the family went to New York for some reason, and um, I don't know why, but we went to um, Museum of Modern Art, and I saw Max Beckman's departure there and I fell in love with German Expressionism and that's where pretty much all my work comes from. It's all hard edge, bright colors um, and I, Max Beckman to this day is still my favorite painter. Um, also when we were in Washington and I remember specifically that it was third grade um, We went to the Air Museum at the Smithsonian, and I fell in love with, model, with airplanes, especially spruce, fabric-covered airplanes, World War I, Wright Brother airplanes, all the, everything, and started building models. And the little balsa wood tissue-covered model airplane dope, rubber band-powered models. And the reason this is important was you did those from blueprints. And so I would lay everything out on the blueprint and I would pin everything to the blueprint and I would glue it. And then when you went out and you got model airplane magazines, um, which were like eight and a half, whatever a magazine was, they'd have plans in it and you'd say, gee, I'd like to build that model airplane. And so I had to teach myself, basically in third, fourth, fifth grade, I taught myself how to be a draftsman. My father went out and got me a T-square and a, and a triangle and a compass and stuff like that and I learned drafting. By the time I was a freshman in high school, I was drafting like crazy and the thing about that is it teaches you perspective, all these things. You do perspective all the time, okay? Uh, and once again, I've gone past. The first time I remember painting was in fifth grade. I'm sure I painted before that, but that was the first time I picked up oil paints. I had a teacher who I actually remember, Mrs. Bartlett. Um, I think she encouraged me mostly because I was real handy. I was real good with these. And that was because of my model airplanes. Um, and so I started painting little landscapes and seascapes and stuff like that in fifth grade, and I kept on doing that forever. Now, when I got to be 14, my parents had an apartment in Hartford, Connecticut, um, and the house on the Cape, and my mother, let's just say my mother was a little. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and my parents' marriage was a little something, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we're not going there, okay? <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we had a choice. Either I went to Hartford High School, which was downtown next to the train station. There were Puerto Rican gangs, there were black gangs, there was everything under the sun. Or else my mother moved to Cape Cod and I went to Barnstable High School, which would have been all right. Come on! <laughs> Thank you. 
Anyway, they sent me off to a small boarding school in northwestern Connecticut called the gunnery. No, it was not a military school. It was founded by a guy named Frederick Gunn in 1850 or something, and he was, um, you know, friends with Emerson and Thoreau and the whole nine yards, and there's old uh, black and white photographs of, you know, guys leaning against the trees out in the wilderness, you know, talking about Plato. I don't know what it was. Anyway, there I had a wonderful art teacher named Mrs. Titus, Margaret Titus, who basically let us do pretty much anything we wanted to do. Um, and at that point, I was still, I, I sort of started developing two styles, i.e. figurative style and landscapes. Um, and I was still doing landscapes like I was doing when I was a kid, um, but then I started, I still have one I did when I was 15 of a bus station. It had three figures in it, sitting on a bench, um, in, a, in the Boston bus station, because I was always going through the Boston bus station on my way to the Cape. Um, and uh, one was sort of, I guess it was pre-hippie days, but sort of a beatnik woman with, you know, a guitar and an old black guy with a big cigar. And the other guy was just sort of a bum, which is basically what you saw in the Boston bus station. Um, and it was all hard edge, just like these, except more cubist, um, or, and flat colors. There was no dimension to it. It was all flat and just blocked in. Um, and so I started doing that, and I ended up being sort of the little art star at the school and stuff like that. I mean, there were other little art stars, but I won the prize, you know? <laughs> Anyway, then I went to BU School of Fine Arts, um, which was in, at that time sort of a hotbed of the Boston Expressionist School. Now we have another question for you. Seeing that you're supposed to ask me questions, I'm going to ask you questions. Anybody other than you, Dan, you keep your hand down. Um, anybody heard of Carl Zerber? No. Uh, <laughs> okay, anybody heard of um, Jack Levine? There we go, we're getting somewhere. Hyman Bloom. Hyman Bloom painted in Lebec, folks. I mean, come on. <laughs> he's in, he's actually, some of his paintings are in one of Carl Little's books. Um, they were all Boston Expressionists. Carl Zerber, I didn't study with these guys. These, I was sort of with the second wave of Boston Expressionists. All my teachers and professors studied with um, these older guys. Carl Zerber had been in, born in Germany. He was left Germany in the early 30s. His paintings were put up as um, uh, degenerate art and burned by the Nazis. Um, Jack Levine was, I, frankly, if you saw Jack Levine's paintings, I think you'd know that you'd seen them sometime in the past. He was sort of a, uh, I guess I call him a socialist, real, social realist, but he painted expressionistically. He was real loose and gorgeous painting, frankly. And Hyman Blue was a wonderful painter, I mean, big thick paint. Carl Zerber, by the way, started using encaustics. I'm not sure if Hyman Bloom did or not. I'm not an art historian. Anyway, I studied with people who you probably have never heard of, seeing that you haven't heard of them and they're sort of semi-famous. <laughs> um, my favorite earlier teacher was Reed Kay, who taught at Skowhegan through the 50s and early 60s. Um, David Aronson, who's pretty well known, and Arthur Polanski, who is pretty well known. Um, John Wilson studied not only at the museum school, he was a black guy, he did a big, huge sculpture of Martin Luther's head after 
He died, I'm not sure what city it's in. Uh, he studied with Leger in Paris at one point. Uh, Conger Metcalf studied both at the museum school and with Grant Wood. Um, he was a drawing teacher and very sort of staid in his ways. BU was really an academic school. I mean, you went in there, and when, I always like to say when you got out of there, you knew how to draw like, like Michelangelo, but you didn't know much else. Um, finally, in my senior year, I studied with a guy named Paul Georges. Uh, he was a guy from Oregon, a big, burly, crude, crusty curmudgeon of a man. He looked like a lumberjack. Um, he had been through, he had gone to the University of Oregon, gone into the Army, fought in the Pacific Theater, been wounded, got all sorts of stars and stuff. He stood about this tall, he was about this wide. And uh, he uh, would, was, his big thing was the big picture. And we would be told to stretch little 10 by 12, get him bored yet, Tom? Yeah? Okay. I'll get through it, you know. <laughs> little 10 by 12 canvases. And this is the first time, the entire time where I was at BU for three years, all we did was draw, paint, draw, draw some more. Um, we ground our own oil paints. We finally, senior year, we get to this Paul George's. Before Jack Levine had sort of taught this class, after that, Philip Gustin came along after I had left BU and taught the class. He taught graduate students and the seniors. It was essentially a uh, something that was trying to get us beyond all the figure stuff and into actually making a statement. And that's where we started getting into narrative work. Um, Paul Georges, again, was part of the Cedar Tavern people in New York. He had started out as an abstract expressionist and before Philip Guston. Um, he, uh, before Philip Guston, he had started painting figuratively again. And he's best known for when he got sued and it went to the Supreme Court he did a painting called the, it wasn't the Rape of the Muse, it was called the Mugging of the Muse, and there was a sort of a model walking by an alley just wrapped in a blanket. Why she'd be out in the middle of the city, I have no idea, and just wrapped in a blanket. But she's walking along a street and there's three guys coming out of the alley. They all have big pointed noses and knives and stuff like that, and they're threatening her. And one of the, and they were sort of wearing masks, some of them were anyway, wearing masks. Um, and one of those masks happened to look like um, one of Paul George's fellow artists. He sued for libel. It went to the Supreme Court. Every political car cartoonist in this country was scared to death that the guy would win the case and political cartooning would be gone. There wouldn't be in the newspapers because you could get sued for libel. And luckily, Paul George's won. Um, that's what he's known for. <laughs> While I was at BU, sophomore year, I started using acrylics. All these paintings in here are acrylic. Um, this is 1967, 68. Acrylics were sort of new at that time. They had been around, but there were two kinds of acrylics. There was Liquitex and I think Beaucourt which came in tubes and worked pretty much like, now we're getting into technique, you know. Um, anyway, they sort of worked like um, oil paint. And then there was, I think it was called permacolor, and it came in a big bottle, had a little squirt nozzle on it. I think it was acrylic polymer-based um, medium, and it didn't work as well, frankly, and you couldn't intermix it with your Liquitex and stuff like that. Um, now I use both Liquitex and golden paint, um, acrylics, um, and nowadays there's, and I'm sure even back then there were all sorts of mediums you could add and gels and stuff like that, um, but frankly I couldn't afford them in those days. Um, when I wanted to make a glaze I just add water and 
So you'd paint on your glaze and it would sort of run down and so you'd get a little more cadmium red at the bottom because it all, gravity took it downhill. Um, whereas nowadays you get a glazing medium and you can put it on and be dispersed pretty well. Um, when I got out of art school, I moved back. I, I rented a, uh, a uh, cabin in Ketuit, um on the Cape. Um, it was two rooms, basically a big room. The ceiling was only about this tall, and I had to cut off the top of my easel, which I still use today, um, but it's been cut off at the top because it wouldn't stand up straight in my place. And it had a bedroom and a little teeny um, bathroom, a little teeny kitchen, or kitchenette, let's say. Um, but I was right down the street from going back to where I started, Ralph Cahoon, who whether you know it or not, his paintings sell for a quarter of a million, a half a million dollars. <laughs> um, and I started working as a picture framer. Stacia's kids here, I, if you have any interest in, in being an artist, learn a trade. <laughs> I remember freshman orientation, we went in at BU and some professor got up and gave a speech and said, 95% of you are never going to make a living from this. Okay, that's great. You know, here we go, four years of money down the tubes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway, I was living down the street from Ralph Cahoon, just down the street. Um, he had a cranberry bog behind his house and a few friends of mine and I would shovel that in the winter time. We'd play hockey on it. He'd come down and hang around and watch us play and his wife would bring us hot cocoa. But anyway, we made, where I worked, we made the picture frames for him. He'd call up and he'd say, I need, and he always got the same frame. Um, he'd call up I'd say, I need a 16 by 20 or something. And we'd say, okay, Ralph. And Rob will bring it home. So I'd drive home and I'd pull into his driveway and it's a big old house that was built in 1775. Now it's called the, it's been turned into a Cahoon, Cahoon Museum. Um, he's dead and his wife is dead and she didn't die that long ago, but he died 82, I think. Um, anyway, um, I'd go in the kitchen and I'd give him his frame. He said, well, Rob, sit down. And he had a big old black wood stove. And I'd sit down and he'd pull out the bottle of bourbon. And we'd swell bourbon for the rest of the night. And he told me one thing. He said, never lose your sense of humor when you're painting. Because his paintings were full of all sorts of little bits of humor. And whether you can find them or not, my little ironic humor is somewhere in there. Um, Anyway, after four years down there, I went back to Boston. I moved into a big house in Brighton on uh, Chestnut Hill Avenue. Um, it was with a few friends of mine from college and um, then a whole bunch of other people. I had a garret on the top floor. After a couple of years, I was showing with, uh, basically with the um, Boston Visual Artists Union, and once in a while I get some sort of little show. I worked as a picture framer again in a gallery out in Wellesley. Um, I, again, I, I, well, not again, I was working in my basement in the, the picture frame gallery. Is, was uh, The picture frame shop was in the basement, which believe me, I've real used to. If anybody knows me, they know that my studio's in my basement too. Um, but anyway, I lived in a garret there, and then after around three years, they literally tore the house down and made it into a parking lot. And we, one of, two of my roommates bought a house out in Newton Corner, and uh, it was a real dump. It was a lovely old Edwardian house, but at that point, I started doing a lot of carpentry, paying for my rent that way, working. It was tough painting. I showed, at that point, I showed at the De Cordova. I was showing at the De Cordova once in a while. Um, I made friends with Fred Walkie, who was the curator at the De Cordova, um, who eventually showed me, when he stopped being curator there, he eventually showed me um, in his gallery in Concord. Um, 
And at that time, in the gallery where I was working, I was framing for a woman named Anne Ballou, and we were showing the work in the gallery of this woman who did silk screens, whose name was Anne Ballou. And I was sort of talking to her, and she said, well, you know, maybe you should take my class. I'm giving a class at the court of a museum, and you can learn how to do silk screens and make lots of money, like I do. And she actually made pretty good money doing silk screens. And so I said, OK. So I started taking silk screen class with Anne Ballou, and it starts out, you stretch your silk, and you learn how to do that, and block out stuff, and stuff like that. And finally, it got to the end of the course, um, and we had to come in with an idea for our final silk screen. Um, and I came in with a painting, uh, oh, say on, you know, on a piece of map board about so big, um, of the Boston Garden with the swan boats and ducks and all. It was just like one of these damn things. And 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 it's like, Anne looked at it and she said, "How the hell are you going to do that? That's going to take 30 or 40 colors, you know." And I said, "Anne, don't worry about it. I'll do it." And I did, and I sold out that edition, and I started doing silk screens. Um, I've done Red Sox, the Bruins, I mean, everything was for the money. <laughs> um, and all those editions, actually, just the other day, I sold to a neighbor, I sold to uh, um, the last of my hockey prints. Um, but anyway, they all had around 35 colors. And what happens when you're doing silkscreen is you're blocking out stuff all the time. And so you start, let's say you want to build a, a cube or anything that's got volume. You basically do the dark color first and then just divide it into three colors, let's say. The light color on top, let's say where the sun is coming down, sort of a middle tone on the side and then finally the darkest tone on the other side. So you're getting a building a cube. And basically, I'd block out the dark outline, and then I'd block out that and sort of print everything the light color, then the middle color, and then finally, so that's like four or five colors just to do one shape. And of course, it went well, they were about so big. And I showed, I did a lot of those, I started doing those in 3D, um, which was added another little number and also makes the edges get harder and harder. You have to understand the paintings I was doing in those days was more expressionistic. Well, uh, not that most of you don't know, in 1970, well, seven, end of 1978, I lost an eye. Um, at which point I could no longer really, I used to paint standing up and I, you know, I had relatively good sized brushes and I'd go like this and I'd flop around and suddenly I couldn't do that anymore. I mean I had to, some, I had no perspective anymore. And so anyway I started going, you know, you put a little finger on something, I know everybody should go. I did this once at the Portland Museum. I went up to one of my paintings and I said, oh, feel here, you know, and they all go, oh, and then you see the guards going. <laughs> but, but anyway, <laughs> so I, you know, I, you end up going like this with your wrist or your little finger and I started using number six sable brushes over and over again. That's all I paint these paintings with, the number six sable brush, for the most part. It's about a half an inch long, three thirty sec seconds of an inch around, and everything is done with that brush. Sure, in the beginning I use a bigger brush to fill in just a rough color and all that, but everything is this teeny little brush. One time the old curmudgeon in Brooklyn, <laughs> he who I'm competing with to be curmudgeon of, you know, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> he he uh, said to me, well, how come it takes you so damn long? Because all these big paintings, they take me a year over a year to do sometimes. He says, how come it takes you so damn long to do a painting? I said, because I'm using this teeny, teeny little brush. He says, well, I can paint a four by eight piece of plywood in, you know, 10 minutes. I said, yeah, well, you try it with a brush, a half an inch long, <laughs> 3 sixteenths of an inch wide, or 3 30 seconds of an inch wide. Um, 
anyway, in 1980, I met Ellen and I moved to Providence. I lived in an apartment on Gano Street. <laughs> I, I had an office in the, I, I had a studio in the CIC building. You remember that? No? Sure. It was behind the old, I know you do, I'm talking to them. They were sort of <laughs> cheering on Providence. <laughs> and uh, it was all full of other artists, mostly people who had gone to RISD and gotten out. Um, it was a great time. I showed a lot of I showed in P-Town. I showed all over the place, and mostly in jury shows. Um, I basically sold out all my prints. Um, and then in 1984, we moved up here, um, out of the blue. Um, mostly, oh, geez, I came to the end of my life here. Um, <laughs> um, and at that point, I sort of... <laughs> I know, that was a double entendre or something. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I dropped out of the art world when I came up here. I, I, I quite literally just paint for myself. All these paintings. Now, how do I do that? I'm not wealthy. My parents weren't wealthy. I banged a lot of nails. I spent six, seven years up here just building houses. I didn't paint at all. I built my own house. Ellen and I pounded every nail in the place. Um, we don't have a mortgage. We built the whole place for $50,000 and that includes buying the land. That's how we do it. Um, she's a writer. She doesn't make much mo more money than I do. Um, <laughs> And frankly, now I'm old enough that I collect from the government until never mind. <laughs> uh, so anyway, let's. T I'm going to talk first. I'm going to try to talk a little quickly about technique. Does anybody have any specific questions about acrylics? Um, I'm going to show you sort of how I came up with this painting here. I do not do sketches. In 2004, in my little I, my little, I don't know what they are, they are five and a half by seven, those little black sketchbooks. I did this little, and this I blew up this morning somehow, I don't think you can see it. it says the end of Dada here, it's basically the fountain here with a big hundred pound weight up here and a, a, tied to a chain and a rope and a pair of scissors nailed to the wall. That way I came up in 2004. It's been sitting in my sketchbook for eons. Um, and I, thought, I sort of thought of it as a New Yorker cartoon or something, something like that. And this is the drawing I did prior to doing this painting. As you can see, I don't, people in the back probably can't see. Um, there are not, a lot of the details came later. I mean, it's just really the rough indications of everything. Um, what I do is I figure out the size. When I'm coming up with these sketches um, or these drawings, I, I'm usually working on one of these. I'm out in the woods. And I'm doing, and I'm just sort of thinking about my next big painting because I'm going to spend a year just doing that. I don't do anything else. It's one thing. I go to my studio. I try to be in it by 7, 7.30 in the morning, and I'm generally there until 5 o'clock at night. I do take, go to the post office and get a cup of coffee at 10 o'clock. I do eat lunch. I do walk the dog. But other than that, I'm pretty much in my studio all day. Um, and I work six and a half days a week probably, and God knows it takes me so friggin' long to do a painting, I'm ready to shoot myself. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> what I do is I grid it out. There's little red lines here. So I'll stretch the canvas, I'll grid it out. 
Now, at some point I find the, the uh, horizon line, which I think is right here. And it's not so important in this painting because there's not that many things that I had to worry. It's more important like in the builders or even in this one, which I have a whole horrible tale about when I changed the entire cap boat even after it was painted because it was wrong. But anyway, um, I take a blue chalk line and I'll snap it over 15, 20 feet of my studio wall. These things are just hanging on nails in my studio. I'll snap a line where that is and that way I can take a nail and stick it in that blue chalk line. Let's say, uh, let's say this line here, I'm trying to find, I can go tack that nail in there and I put a, tie a little string to it and I do the perspective. And this one is not all that important, but some of these, there's a lot of perspective in them. Um, then I draw it in with charcoal. I'll sort of take a one inch brush, a half inch brush, I don't know, um, and paint in the rough colors. Um, and then I go down to my number six brush for the rest. The first month's a lot of fun. Ten months is hell. The last month is a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I work from top to bottom, generally about three times. But it's not that I don't get hung up. I'll work down and let's say I'll, you know, you try and essentially to work from the back to the forward um, when you do work from the top of the bottom. So you're working on the sky and you uh, start working up the clouds and you start, these are pretty vague at this point. You work down, you start making up the, this is all made up, none of this is real, it's all coming out of here. Um, the trees, I go out sometimes, but this one and that painting especially, I go out and I'll cut a branch off an ash tree or a maple tree and I'll string it by a wire from the ceiling of my, my studio and I'll spin it around and get it into the right place and I'll sit there and I'll sort of try and draw it the way it is and after around a day it all goes limp and drops and I have to go out and slaughter another little mini ash tree or something. Um, <laughs> I use, every time I go through, I'll put a coat of polymer, you know, acrylic polymer, gloss medium over it. And if I work only on these trees one day, I will put a coat of gloss medium over it then too. And so probably by the end of one of these things, there's 30 or 40 coats of gloss medium over all of them. Um, in the initial period, I like that because it fills up the canvas, the weave of the canvas. Um, and because I use a lot of gloss on the glazes, I mean a lot of glazing compound. Um, glazing compound, you mix your paint with it. Let's say you're doing his head and you want to put cobalt blue to form the shadow. Maybe a little green in there to... You, you, you put it on, you could put it on his entire head and then with a, a, a wet towel, you can just wipe it off and make a, it's like drawing with charcoal or, or, or Conti crayon where you're using an eraser instead. You could just pull it off. And the other thing about it is with the, the uh, gloss medium underneath it, the next day, even though that has dried, you can come back with um, steel wool and actually go and it all disappears. <laughs> so if you really screw up, you can fix it. Um, Anyway, I don't know. Does anybody have questions about technique? Yeah. So what, uh, I don't know oh. about technique, but uh, why, why acrylics versus oils? Okay, because I was a rebel. <laughs> but essentially, I have done a bunch of oil landscapes, and it drives me nuts how long they take to dry. It really drives me nuts. I love the smell of turpentine in the morning and linseed oil in the morning. I really do. Um, but, and I like oils fine. It's just, I, I know they do. I know they do. But, you know, hey, I only got so much room. <laughs> yeah, Kate. Because of the size of your canvas, yeah. and the size of that brush, yeah. 
um, what sorts of amounts of paint are you blending to get your colors, and how do you keep your values consistent through the paint? Okay, acrylics. Acrylics are a real pain. They dry just a hair bit darker than what you put them on, on with. That's, that's a good reason to go to oils, because at least they sort of stay the same. <laughs> so you get used to that after a while, but you never totally figure it out, okay? Um, if I'm... You're asking how much paint do I mix to... Well, because um, I paint with acrylics as well, they do, they dry really quickly, and I, I work just the other way, I work very small, but I'm thinking, so you, um, your greens... You Believe me, Kate, paint. half the time I'm working on a space like that for a week. So are you only mixing... That's it. Why do you think these things take me a week, uh, a year? <laughs> So you must, I'm just what I'm saying, you must have a dead eye for blending these colors because... No, 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 it's, those, the, these maple leaves here yeah. in this painting, yeah. five different times. I've never counted how many maple leaves there are in that thing, but I changed their color five times. And there's probably 500 leaves, and they all have little veins in them. <laughs> That's, that's anal. <laughs> now, any other questions about technique? Okay, Dan, you're going to help me when I get the data, right? <laughs> Karen wants me to talk a little about dataism. Um, and so I'm going to attempt to do it using this. And believe me, I'm not an art historian. Um, I don't have any theories. Um, frankly, if you have to talk about your paintings, I think you've pretty much failed. Um, but anyway, Dadaism started in 1916 in Zurich, Switzerland. There was, and I'm going to point out these, some of these things as I go along. That's Tristan Zara's calling card. It was just a little pointy finger. Um, he was a writer and a poet. Um, he and Hugo Ball, that guy there in the funny costume, and Jean Arp, those are sort of taken from his sculptures, and that's from a li that little spru red spruce tree there is taken from one of his sort of relief paintings. Um, they came together in 1916. Tristan Zara wrote the Dadaist Manifesto, which I read just last night again, and it's absolute gibberish. It, there's nothing to it. I mean, it's crazy, if you ask me anyway. I mean, maybe somebody can read something into it. But they were essentially, you have to realize that at this time World War I was going on. In 1916, the Battle of Somme was going on. There were hundreds of thousands of people dying over 100 feet of trenches, you know, constantly. And these guys were essentially, uh, they were running away from being enlisted. They were draft dodgers in a sense, or at least some of them were. Um, and they were so fed, I guess the point of Dadaism, other than buffoonery, which I try to live up to, and, but anyway, um, I guess the point of Dadaism was that um, they were saying that, look what civilization has gotten us, and to hell with it. And so they were rejecting pretty much everything or they thought they were rejecting everything that had gone on prior, whether that be their culturally, artistically, um, as far as pol politics went. That didn't last forever. Dadaism as a movement only lasted, I think it started to die in Europe anyway, around 1920, 23 maybe at the latest. Um, at the same time, um, oh, I forgot Sophie Tauber, I think is how you pronounce her name. Um, she w eventually became uh, Jean Arp's wife. 
She was another artist involved, and she did a lot of costumes for, she didn't do this particular costume, but this here is Hugo Ball at the first, uh, at the Cafe Voltaire, which he ran, and he did sound poems, which actually are sort of interesting. I found one on the internet and listened to it, and even though it's just, so, uh, what, um, letters and syllables, when it's spoken in whatever language, German or French or whatever, it actually sounds pretty neat. It, it means nothing, but it sounds sort of neat. And in fact, what's his name? David Byrne and the Talking Heads at some point used one, some sound poem in one of their songs, some disco number where they used it. Uh, anyway. Kurt Swithers, who was a German, showed up in Zurich at that time. Here is a letter poem. I don't know what this would, this is an actual poem, um, although I had to sort of end it quickly, so it probably doesn't come to a conclusion. <laughs> it sort of ends on a dissonant note, because I ran out of space. But anyway, um, he ends up being a collagist in, in in Germany after the war. Um, let's see, who else do we have? So Hugo Ball started again happenings. 1960s. Performance art. All of this came out of Dadaism because of this guy and people like him who started performing and doing bizarre you people look so enthralled with this. <laughs> anyway, um, then there was another movement, the German Dadas. The German Dadas were sort of started by a guy named Raul Hausmann, who was in Zurich initially, um, and his, at the time, partner, Hannah Hock, sort of came back from, he came back from Zurich to Berlin and German Dadaism was much more political. Um, they were actually protesting the, uh, in a lot of ways, the, what is it, the Weimar, Weimar, Weimar. Weimar Republic and they were, they were being, their art shows were being closed down because they would sort of put the, sort of, and they weren't really Nazis yet, but they would make fun of the army people and the government and stuff like that. And a lot of those people were, we're almost done. Uh, uh, George Gross, Otto Dix, all ended up being German expressionists. Uh, Schwithers, who I mentioned. Max Ernst, that's a Max Ernst chess set. He was in Cologne, I believe. He ended up being a surrealist. A lot of surrealism comes out of Dadaism. Then we go to Paris a little later on, and Francis Picabia, which I've sort of done this trawler. Oh, that's George Gross, by the way. That comes from one of his paintings. Um, this. Uh, all the machinery in this is not really taken from anything he did, but it's reflect. He did a lot of stuff that was sort of like Russian constructivism and very, all sorts of mechanical stuff. And then Duchamp. Now Duchamp didn't last long. He ended up in New York, um, but in 19, well, he did New Descending the Staircase, and I think he entered it in the and it was not accepted, and even though New Descending the Staircase, I admit, is Cubism, um, it was not accepted, um, and it, you know anything more than I do, please speak up. <laughs> what? Wait a minute, I'll get to 1917. But in, <laughs> in 19... 1913, I think it was, he, he did New Descending to Staircase, attempted to show it in, um, in Paris in an independent show. Now these independent shows supposedly had no juries and no prizes. It was still rejected. Um, he eventually, even while he was still in Paris, started doing 
ready-mades, this bicycle wheel was something he did while he was in Paris. I don't know when exactly he came to New York. He met up with Man Ray, who was reworking photographs. This was just a, a model that he had taken a photograph of and he drew on ink these little clefts for the violin thing. Um, he met up with Man Ray and they started, well eventually they started the New York Dot, well what was it called? The New York New York Data, which the one issue of a magazine, but anyway, um, in 1917, um, they, Marcel Duchamp, and what's interesting is that Joseph Stella, the painter of the Brooklyn Bridge, I don't know if any of you know them, him, but he went to, they went to a plumbing supply place, actually it was in Irons Works. They bought a urinal. And so then they tipped it on its side, put it on a little pedestal, signed it R. Mutt, 1917. The, the plumbing supply place was called L.L. Mott, so I guess that's where maybe Mutt came from. Um, they entered it in another quote unquote unjuried, unprized show of independent artists in New York in 1917 and it was rejected even though Duchamp who was at that point a famous artist was on one of the board members of the group that tried to get the thing together they kicked the piece out of that piece in 2004 I read 500 artists curators art historians um, gallery owners were asked what was the most influential piece of 20th century art? Right there, a urinal on its side. And, you know, Guernica, Picasso's Guernica came in second, and, and you know, Damazel's, de, what is it, Ab Avignon. Avignon came in third, or something like that. But right there, 64% said that was the most influential. And Dadaism, I quite frankly, in itself probably was. Um, because it did lead to everything else I have in this little painting, sort of. Um, we'll start, I, I can just, I'm just going to point these things out. Um, from my joke of scissors that would cut off the anvil and drop on the, um, or break the most important piece of artwork in the, or most influential piece. I have Joseph Weiss coming up. Joseph Weiss was a German fluxist in the 60s and 70s. He did a lot of happenings. He did a lot of sculpture. Um, way back here I have Ed Keinholz who was from California, he wasn't really a pop artist, but he's sort of thrown in there as being a pop artist. Um, he did a pretty gruesome pictures of uh, madhouses, and, or not pictures, but sculptures of madhouses. Um, Carol Walker, who I include because Man Ray was doing, at some point he would take photographic paper and he would throw nails and paper clips and stuff and just expose the photographic paper to the light and it would just make that image. And in a way she uses silhouettes on a white wall to make her images. This is Tom Curry here chasing his black muse, sorry Kim, and that's his stupid island. <laughs> <laughs> um, Keith Herring, Ra uh, Rauschenberg, um, I don't know, Jasper Johns. Uh, this is a Dada's piece done by Morton in 1925 in. Uh, New York, uh, Morton Schlomberg, I think his name was. Although now there's some question whether Baroness, some crazy lady who lived in Greenwich Village did, and he wasn't just the ph photographer who did it. Um, but anyway, that's entitled God. It's basically a plumbing fixture. And I threw in Howell, which I guess may be Dottis. I don't know whether it is. But when 
Uh, they tried to close down the publishing by uh, Ferlinghetti's publishing place of Allen Ginsberg's poem Howell. The guy from, I don't know what it was, University of Southern California or someplace, some art professor got up there, a poetry professor, got up and claimed that it was a Dadaist plot and it shouldn't be published. I mean, this is, what, 1950. I mean, who even remembered Dadaists in 1950? I don't know. Um, I guess that's about all I got to say. That's an hour. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. In that river, or bay, whatever, right. there's an arrangement of stones that looks like a pretty woman underwater there. What? It looks too deliberate to not... No, I, I don't even know what you're talking about, Dan. <laughs> oh, there's a, a slice taken out of the... A very scissor-like yeah, slice taken... Yeah, there. Right there. That, that's... You can't tell me that was just a random. It wasn't random in the sense it has something to do to composition, but it wasn't a pregnant lady or whatever you claimed it was. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what interests me most about everything, including landscapes, is composition. The more complicated they are, the more fun it is for me. What can I tell you? What, I'm, what? what about when you do a piece like this? Do you have a theme that you're thinking about when you're putting it together? Like do we don't want to go there, do we? <laughs> I did bring the original sketch for that one. You can see it's changed. The dog's in a different position. I added those two trees there. Um, that is, in reality, this is sort of like Pudic Road, um, which is right around the corner from me. Um, this is like Larry Mariner's old house that the Reverend Scott lives in now, except it's been fixed up. And Larry Mariner used to have his burned up um, lobster boat next to it. And so that's sort of done from that. Um, that's my license plate and my chainsaw and, you know, that's my telephone number, my dog, my cat, or, you know, our, you know all that stuff. That's sort of me. Um, <laughs> the theme, you want me to go there, huh? <laughs> the, the theme is growing, spending most of my youth on, you know, real youth on Cape Cod. I saw it go to hell. And it's different than here because Boston and Cape Cod's only, Boston and Cape Cod was only an hour apart. You could get there in an hour and a quarter. Here, you know, you got Bangor. I go to Bangor in an hour and a quarter and I go to the theater and it's not like Bangor is ever going to be Boston. Um, but what happens is we get lots of big houses that end up not fitting in all that well. Although, in all honesty, they employ everybody. And so you can't really gripe about it. But at times, you wonder what's going to happen to the sensibilities of everybody. That's what that's about. You know, I mean, I've banged so many nails in houses like that. I mean, that's how I save my money, you know? So, what do you do? Any other questions? Uh oh. It's a, it's a follow up, but does your, so you map, you map your compositions, but do your narratives uh, grow and deepen and evolve on the canvas? I add things over. I do have a narrative that's set in the beginning, mm -hmm. um, but as time goes on, people come in and look and sort of say, oh, maybe you should put that in. I go, hey, that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> and so, you know, I add stuff that people may suggest to me. I, you know, so, and sometimes I'll come, I'll read something and come up with some idea and I'll add that. Yeah. Why did you change the boat for <laughs> This is, my first job was at Crosby's Uh, boatyard on the Cape, and that's what this is sort of remembering. But this is Center Harbor in Brooklyn. 
That again is a made up Shadow Island. <laughs> Long before you ever painted Shadow Island. <laughs> um, a lot of these people were around Brooklyn. Um, and what happened was, cap boats are a real pain. Boats, the perspective in boats, because you, you have lines, you know, shapes going every which way. And so even though you set it up as a, a rectangle, this is higher, this is lower. And what happened with this was, it, I couldn't, I, was, I did this in another place where it was on an easel. And so I couldn't have my strings and stuff like that. So what I did was I took all this little quarter by two inch or one inch pieces of wood and I masked them, taped them together and I had them, I laid the painting on the floor and it just looked wrong. And rather than being sensible and doing it on a piece of you know, paper where I could have all the vanishing points, I laid it all out and nailed, put a nail in the floor and had this stick so I could go this way and that way to make the perspective. And finally I got it right. So, you know, I don't do things simply. You know? <laughs> yeah? All your paintings, all those paintings except this one are locally. Where did you get the idea to do that? Was it just the idea of going old? Which one? I, it was just a change. It was just, just something different. Just something. I mean, that's a main landscape. Yeah. I was trying to fit something into a, a main landscape. I, I never really talked about landscapes, and I don't want to bore you, but um, the three small ones here I spent three hours on, um, or if that. When I went on a canoe trip, each one I'd stop and wherever we sent up camp, I'd, do, I'd work maybe two hours um, just doing a sketch of that. I used little Elmer's glue company, you know, boarding, Borden's or Elsie or whoever it is. They make little uh, acrylic, like Pentel pens, but they have, have uh, acrylic paint in them and they have different size felt tips so you can, you know, do drawings with them in acrylic paint. I do that on rag paper out in the woods. I take it that rag paper in um, on backpacking trips, and I take one of those little kitty acrylic sets with the little teeny tubes that look like the old watercolor tubes you used to buy, and a couple of brushes, and I'll sort of do sketches along the way. But I only spend I don't know three. At, at the most three hours on something and then I come home and I'll spend two months finishing and it's all from up here so I just make it up it's all gibberish anyway. anybody else? What? What? So are these your model airplanes up here? Gee you notice all those airplanes? <laughs> it's just a way of signing my name um, I sort of put them in at the very last minute um, what, <clears throat> why they're really here, and they're in pretty much every picture, except this one, I'm, I'm in a jet airplane, you say, so. <laughs> um, uh, what happens is, back in 1971, I have a painting. I was on top in a, in a, in a cabin on the long trail on, um, in Vermont in the Green Mountains called Skyline Lodge and I was painting a picture on the, it had a little porch in this cabin, it was a pretty slick cabin. Um, and I was painting a picture on the cover uh, on the porch and I was sitting there and frankly a jet plane went right over me. And I've been on Sugarloaf and places like that, they use those jet planes to turn around. No matter where I've gone in my backpacking and canoe trips, there's always an airplane. Usually it's a little thing like that. The only place I've gone where there hasn't been one was like west, middle western Quebec where I was in the middle of nowhere. So anyway, anything else? Yeah. Say that again. A lot of trees? Yeah, I do. Um, I like trees. I mean, they're, they're, they're particularly hard to do, I think, frankly. I mean, to get those things to 
hang over everything is and the shadows that might fall underneath and when I'm not really doing them from life I'm just thinking them up um, it's sometimes a little tough but anyway I do them. Yeah? Why is he carrying the, the dog? Well I think he was buffoonery that's what Dada was about. It was just a it's sort of a joke. I mean, the guy, I like that dog. <laughs> I think he's cute and he's fun. <laughs> he also fits in red. I mean, the other thing about the airplane, you were asking about the airplane, that painting over there, I put in the airplane at the final end and it didn't work and I, I kept switching around. What I do a lot of times is I'll, I'll take a little piece of red paper I'll cut out of the magazine or any color paper, whatever I'm doing and if I need to balance it with something I'll stick it out, lick it and I'll stick it on and you know it won't be right so I'll pull it off and I'll lick it again and I'll stick it somewhere else and finally it'll be right. Well that one over there I kept put, trying to put the red airplane in and it it would sort of work, but it didn't quite work. And finally, at the final end, I figured out I put a little red kite in the far left corner, and that made the whole thing balance. And that's what I mean is composition. That's what I care about. Anyway, anybody else? No, I'd like to thank you, Rob. Yeah.